Okay, again, welcome everybody to uh, AI Talks, uh, which is a series of talks uh, hosted by CHAIR, which is uh, Chalmers uh, AI Center. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Dr. Martin Danelian with us, uh, giving a talk. Uh, so Martin is a group leader and a lecturer at ETH Zurich. Uh, so ETH Zurich is one of the strongest research institute in the world of AI with lots of uh, very world-class researchers, uh, including Martin, of course. Uh, Martin has a PhD in computer vision from uh, Linköping University from 2018. He won the Best Nordic Thesis Award in Image analysis, analysis in 2019 and has since then won several other awards uh, for his research work. So uh, with that, I leave the floor to you, Martin. Please go ahead. Well, one thing I should mention, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, we may ask them directly or save them for after the talk. Uh, so, okay, please, Martin, go ahead. Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. So as you can see, my talk is uh, titled Deep Visual Reasoning with optimization-based network modules. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so, I'll start talking a little bit about what has become sort of standard strategy that we used in uh, that we use in computer vision and deep learning based computer vision, and certainly in many other AI fields as well. So usually we start with a big uh, data set. So for instance, if we want to do image classification, we might use the ImageNet data set, which is pretty famous nowadays. Uh, we take a big neural network that we then want to train on this data set. And this, of course, we know how to do pretty well now. And we have, uh, um, in the last decade, learned quite a lot. So uh, things like backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, of course, goes back to the 80s, uh, but also other techniques like ReLU, batch normalizations, residual connections, and so on. So if you're into deep learning, you're certainly familiar with many of these uh, concepts. So this we can do very well nowadays. Uh, when we have trained our network, we of course want to do predictions. So uh, usually our network has a quite simple structure, convolutional neural network, for instance, we just feed our image and we have a quite feed forward operations, we get our prediction like. So again, if we want to do image classification, we get the label cat as output for this uh, input image, for instance. Okay, so this has wor worked extraordinarily well for a large number of tasks in computer vision. So not only image classification, but uh, object, oh, okay. object detection, where we not only want to classify objects, but also localize them in terms of um, a bounding box, for instance. So here we might train our detectors on the COCO data set that also contains thousands or tens of thousands of images. We might want to do semantic segmentation where we want to classify every single pixel into a predefined category or set of categories. So we can uh, very accurately uh, predict the complete extent of every semantic class or every object in the image. And we have had a tremendous progress in each of these tasks. So if we start with image classification. Uh, of course, we have uh, the AlexNet in 2012 that really started a deep learning revolution in, uh, in computer vision. And after that, we had things like the, the VGG architecture uh, that did some simplifications, added some new uh, modules. Um, uh, we had the ResNet in 2016 that introduced uh, residual connections uh, or skipped connections. So with this, we could train much deeper uh, networks and well, if you're not familiar with computer vision, each of these papers have around 80,000 uh, citations now, I think. So they have, a have had a huge impact and not only in computer vision. And um, so image classification had really been 
a playground for developing better architectures for the underlying image representations we use. So they have been hugely useful also in other tasks. And more recently, we have had also attention-based uh, approaches, like most famously the, the vision transformer very recently. And well, if you note, I didn't put the paper between 2016 and 2021, not necessarily because nothing happened between these years in image classification, but ResNet has been so tremendously successful and we're still using it and it's still the de facto standard in so many tasks. So the improvements after that were quite small and often not really worth it because they took more memory or more not as efficient and so on. So ResNet has been very simple, robust, a network that, that we still largely use. This is probably about to change now, by the way, with the introduction of that attention-based um, backbone networks that are becoming pretty good. Anyway, in object detection, we have had a similar story starting really from the, the RCNN. We uh, extract features from local regions, classify them, the bottom box regression and so on. We had improvement with the faster RCNN, uh, the first uh, one stage detector, uh, YOLO, that was also very efficient. Uh, we have also had uh, very recent advancements with transformers, attention-based uh, modules that have been very uh, influential in, in not only detection, but also other vision tasks. And also in semantic segmentations, where the challenge was initially, how do we modify these uh, networks that were really defined to only do one prediction, to predict one class for, for every pixel in the image? Uh, so this was uh, was the challenges that are addressed in, in many works, like introducing dilated convolutions, the PSP net, and so on. So what we can do nowadays with very impressive performance is uh, basically this, right? That we can localize objects, classify them, segment them with quite impressive robustness and accuracy, I would say. I should say that this is not even a state-of-the-art network. This is mask RCNN, so it's a few years old, and it's trained on the Cocoa dataset, so it's not even trained for uh, autonomous driving scenarios. And still, it works surprisingly robustly and, and do, does pretty well here as well. So the question to ask now is that, is this uh, everything? Can we apply this strategy to everything? And did this uh, solve most computer vision tasks so that we uh, train a network on a huge data set and then do feed forward inference. So let's think about this for a second. Um, first of all, uh, what about learning from little data? So if we look around, most of the classes, I mean, if we really want to try to label and categorize everything, most of the classes are actually pretty rare, right? right. So for instance, there is a recent uh, quite large scale data set called the Elvis data set that basically tries to do this from a quite large collection of images. And over half of the classes they identify have less than uh, 10, 10 instances per, per class. And many of them have only a single one, right? And so moreover, even if we in practice could uh, label uh, a lot of, or collect a lot of data for every category, this would be incredibly costly, right? So we cannot, uh, we cannot solely rely on that. We'll always have a big data set that we can train on. Second, maybe more importantly, if we want to develop more advanced AI systems and autonomous agents, we need to let them be able to learn on the fly, right? We cannot only pre-train them on a large data set on a GPU cluster for a week, and then that's it. That's, that's their knowledge they have, right? but we want them to be able to learn new tasks, new concepts, new categories. We want them to be able to update their knowledge and adapt to new circumstances, right? And well, this might look pretty futuristic, even though there is rapid progress in robotics in autonomous driving and so on, but for even quite basic AI system, you require this. So if you want to do open world detection or segmentation, we need to be able to recognize, learn new classes that we haven't seen yet or haven't seen in our training set 
And many of these applications where you have interaction between human and, and AI or human and computers, like if you want to do image or video editing or annotations, uh, we need the system to learn from uh, human input quickly, right? And on the fly. So this is usually important. Um, another thing is that, well, I mentioned classifications, segmentation and detection, where this parting has worked really well, but there are also other tasks, right? That not, don't necessarily fit very well into this forward, forward parting. We might have multiple inputs, multiple inputs that are also fundamentally different. Uh, we might also require more complex reasoning across different inputs and more globally, right? Which is difficult to achieve or more or less impossible to achieve with just a straight uh, convolutional neural network architecture. So for example, or examples we'll look at is uh, tracking and uh, matching that also have some of these characteristics. Okay, so in this talk, I will present how we can uh, design deep neural networks that learns and reasons by internally optimizing an objective function. And we'll do this by looking at applications such as uh, tracking, video segmentation, fusion classification and segmentation. Uh, hopefully I have time to talk about the image correspondences a bit and uh, multi-frame image restoration, I realize I won't have time to go into, but we have re really recent work there. So if you're interested how we can apply um, methods inspired by, uh, by the approaches I will talk about here to, for, for instance, burst super resolution denoising, you can also check that out after or ask me about it. Okay, so first I will talk about uh, a work that we presented more or less two years ago. Uh, learning descriptive model uh, prediction for tracking. Okay, so first of all, uh, tracking is one of these classical and quite fundamental tasks in uh, computer vision that, of course, we as humans do quite effortlessly. Um, tracking comes in very many different forms. We want to track, for instance, local uh, feature points in order to be able to do 3D reconstruction. Uh, track objects from multiple objects from predefined set of categories or totally generic unseen objects, right? So if you just give the system something, it should be able to track it. Uh, what I will mostly talk about is this latter uh, type of tracking that we sometimes call uh, appearance based tracking or generic visual tracking. So here we're given a reference frame, for instance, an initial frame where the object is somehow given to us uh, we, with a, as a bounding box, for instance, could be a human annotated frame, it could be some automatic detector, motion detector, salient object detector, or, or uh, something like that, that gives us this initial annotation. Then given solely this information, we want to be able to, to track this uh, object throughout the video sequence. Uh, so basically estimating its uh, bounding box in this case for, for each frame. Okay, so let's think about how we can go ahead uh, to design a tracking approach. And so if you think about this a little bit, I think the conclusion you would also reach is that, okay, why not train a classifier, right? We can extract some patches from uh, within the bounding box, some from the background, and just train a discriminative classifier on this, given potentially some feature representation of this uh, of these patches. And this is what we were doing <laughs> in the in the old days, sort of in pre deep learning era, right? And uh, it worked really well. You can train this classifier uh, given the next frame. So a test frame, you apply it, you can apply it in a convolutional manner. For instance, if it's a linear classifier, you can see it as a convolution, right? Uh, you get some classification score for each uh, pixel or with some stride potentially here, right? And we find the most uh, confident prediction. And this, um, this is how we find, find the object in the next frame. Uh, optionally, we can also try to use this information to then 
uh, again update our classifier with this uh, predicted uh, location of our of our object okay the question now is how can we now do this in an end-to-end -end tracking architecture so uh, if we really want to learn the full tracking system okay first we of course want to extract some some deep features from our reference frame and then we have this online learning component so this should learn this representation about the target that that we want to track this representation could for instance be then the the parameters uh, of a classifier that we then apply on the test frame to get some classification scores or confidence scores okay so what is different here so we want this online learning module to of course be robust and, and fast i mean tracking is really an online problem we want to be able to do it uh, very quickly um, what is new here that was really brought by the by the sort of end-to-end -end deep learning is that we of course now want to be able to train our full tracking system um, so then i'm not talking about the representation that we are learning of this specific object right but our deep features and maybe other parts of our tracking system and turned on annotated uh, videos. So we want to be able to formulate some kind of uh, loss or tracking error and then back propagate uh, gradients throughout our system, right? So our online learning module itself has to be differentiable for us to achieve this. Okay, so how can we go ahead and do that? So the simplest thing you can do, which was the starting point in, in literature and and uh, yeah um is uh, to basically do what's called the cme tracking but essentially comparing um or do similarity matching so okay what we do is to completely discard background we just uh, extract the target appearance we uh, encode it with uh, do the feature encoding of it and then we just do cross correlation between uh, those features and the features extracted from a test frame so this is trivially differentiable uh, the question is is it robust enough and the answer is most often no if you have some similar object in in the test frame for instance another phase here uh, you would um, uh, um, the, the tracker would usually be confused because you have a very challenging case now with two similar objects You'd, your um, classifier would fire on on two different regions, and you wouldn't know which one to choose, or you, you would choose the wrong one. And the issue here is, I said, like if we would have had a reference example with the other distractor face in the background, uh, we could have uh, exploited it. But now we are completely disregarding all, all background, right? OK, so this is what we want to try to do. So the difficulty here is how can we also use this background negative information to learn a more powerful more robust representation of uh, the target object um, and well the answer i've already given to you that we should learn uh, a classifier a discriminative uh, classifier of uh, our target um, now the challenges as you see here is that okay we have uh, a learning problem here for our target but this learning problem is embedded in another learning problem right uh, which is the end-to-end -end training of our full uh, architecture so uh, learning to learn or what's called meta learning naturally comes in here and as we'll see this is a very general concept and our approach will also generalize to lots of uh, other tasks that have this meta learning characteristic and it turns out we can also generalize it uh, beyond sort of only meta learning applications uh, but this is the fundamental uh, uh, also very interesting thing here that we are embedding a learning problem inside our deep neural network uh, architecture uh, okay so the question now how can we then embed a discriminative learning approach into uh, into our end-to-end -end architecture 
So how can we train a discriminative classifier? Well, uh, we, uh, the easiest way to do that is to minimize an objective. You might think of support vector machines. Let's start with something simpler. Let's just do linear least squares regression or linear least squares classification. So we have our classifier weights, uh, which is just a convolution filter. We apply it to the deep features extracted from our training samples. And so we minimize the error between that prediction and our label confidence scores, we can, which we can design as some kind of a smooth function like this that is zero in the background and one uh, at the target itself. Uh, okay. Um, I'll talk about how we can minimize this later, but let's just assume that we can minimize this. So we have a module, a function that performs this uh, minimization uh, that minimizes this loss given, uh, given the, the features and the labels and then ideally we can treat this as a neural network module and put it into our architecture. And, but to do that, this needs to be differentiable with respect to our input features. And later we also want it to be differentiable to the labels themselves as we'll see. Okay, so if we can achieve this, we can put our um, module here that minimizes the, the objective and outputs uh, the, the optimal weights for the classifier, which we then apply to the test frame. Okay, so the interesting part now, how can we then find a differentiable solution to, to such a minimization problem? And there are in fact several alternatives that you can use. One is that if you have an optimization problem that uh, allows a, uh, an analytic solution, that is differentiable, you can use that. And uh, if we go back to least squares objective, this, if we write it in matrix form, this of course has a, a differentiable analytic expression. Uh, the problem is that, okay, one, we might not uh, all, always be able to derive such an analytic expression. We might want to have a nonlinear objective or whatever. Uh, but even in this case, it's quite costly to solve uh, this analytic uh, expression and differentiate through it as so it's not really optimal. Um, another very interesting approach is to use the implicit function theorem. So here we can apply a nonlinear solver. So basically any kind of black box solver. And then we can use the implicit function theorem to differentiate through the solution or a local minimum to be more precise. And um, uh, this is quite general approach. Uh, the problem again is that for our applications it's still quite costly to do this both to solve for the for the minimum and to differentiate differentiate through the solution itself is is uh, unnecessarily costly in our our case uh, but it's a very cool technique that have lots of uh, other useful applications so if you're interested in it you can check out this reference for instance there are other good references as well so we use a third alternative, and that is to have a differentiable optimizer. So uh, we have optimization steps, which are themselves differentiable that we can unroll. And uh, this is a quite general technique and will be uh, fast in our case. And to be more specific, uh, we will use steepest descent with quadratic approximations. So Newton or Gauss-Newton, for instance, uh, but I will actually talk about these details a bit, bit later in the talk. Uh, okay, so some uh, comments here. Um, I presented a, uh, just a linear least squares objective. So we can use, and actually in this particular work, we used a nonlinear formulation. So we can further improve performance by have a hinge like um, uh, loss. And so inspired by support vector machines and so on. Um, we can also use uh, cross entropy KL divergence. Uh, objectives. So we did that in another work, uh, follow-up work, where we had a probabilistic uh, regression formulation. Uh, another very important point is that there's nothing here that says that we actually need to reach the optimum. Okay, here I wrote it as the argmin, but that was more to, to be able to write this out in a simple way. Um, 
our only goal here is to minimize this objective sufficiently so we can integrate uh, information from the reference images, from the training images, uh, in order to predict this uh, target representation. I mean, it might even be beneficial to not reach the optimum because we might overfit to some particular target appearance and so on. So there might be other applications where it is very important to reach the optimum, but for the problems I will and applications I'll present here, that is definitely not necessary. We just want to minimize this objective sufficiently to integrate this information. And another very useful technique we, we do here is to learn a very simple initializer that gives us a very good starting point in our initialization. And then, uh, then we can go from there with this uh, iterative steepest descent technique. Okay, so we could write out our full architecture. We have uh, this uh, model uh, initializer. Uh, we have the optimizer that also takes into account the background information. Um, we can very easily train this uh, offline on, on large annotated uh, video data sets. Uh, we just sample a reference set and a test set, feed them into the network, uh, minimize the final uh, objective, where we define some objective on the final confidence or classification scores. There's nothing complicated here. Um, and okay. Uh, and just some results. We see that the optimizer is uh, really uh, important for the robustness of the tracker. Uh, we were surprised about how important end-to-end -end training is, is, even though we start from ImageNet features that are themselves really, really good. We still benefit a lot from being able to do end-to-end -end training and adapt our deep features to, um, to the tracking task in this case. And yeah, at the time we achieved uh, very good uh, state-of-the-art results. I mean, since then there's been us and other works really building upon this, this approach or so. Okay, very briefly, I will talk how uh, we can apply this quite general idea and so also for completely different tasks, such as a few shot classification. So instead of only training our classifiers on, on uh, or image classification techniques on, on very large data sets such as ImageNet, ImageNet, in practice, as I said, we want to be able to learn from little data. We want to be able to learn new concepts on the fly, right? So we want to have a network or a method that can give in a support set of a few or just one label image per class, be able to do prediction on uh, new core images. Uh, so our approach here is in a way the structure is quite similar instead of the reference image uh, for tracking. Uh, we have our support set, uh, we extract the features, uh, we have our online learner, which is called base learner here, predicting the parameters of our final classifier. Um, the interesting differences here is that, okay, we have the inductive loss, which is similar to what we were doing in tracking with some the differences here, you could apply cross entropy. We still found, found it more robust to do these uh, robust least square subjectives. Uh, anyway, um, what's interesting here is that we can also involve the query set. So even, we, even though we don't have labels on the query uh, images, we can do things like uh, entropy minimization and have a transductive uh, loss here. And this really benefits performance because we have so little data. So basically we are trying to maximize the confidence on, on the query set in, in a sense. Uh, okay, let's now look at how we can further generalize this. So we'll see how we can uh, make this into an internal network module. So now, until now it has really sat on, on the sort of prediction side. And we will look at how we can also learned objective itself to, to do uh, even more general things. Okay, and for this, I will present uh, this work we presented last year, learning what to learn for video object segmentation. So quickly about video object segmentation. So the setup is um, basically a generalization of the tracking setup I showed. The difference is that given a segmentation mask or given the target, now we want to segment object in each frame. So as you can see, this um, 
adds quite a bit of more challenges. We also need to be able to predict an accurate segmentation mask while still being robust. Okay, so we could think about developing a first uh, approach based on this uh, tracking method I uh, showed before. Uh, so um, we extract some features. And now instead of predicting the confidence score of the target, we try to predict the full segmentation map of the target. So we minimize the error between the prediction and the annotated segmentation mask Y here. And so here I call this filter tau because we will generalize it. It will not really be a classifier anymore. Uh, okay. Uh, so we could try to do this. Uh, now, uh, now we want to do prediction on uh, the test frame, so the next frame in the sequence, for instance. Uh, the problem is that, of course, from one convolutional layer, we cannot really learn accurate uh, segmentation. Um, it's quite different from just estimating the confidence of the target. We need very accurate boundaries and so on to do accurate segmentation, so this is not enough. But what we could do is to input this into a convolutional uh, deep neural network decoder that we train to upsample, uh, or it will basically use this output as a guide and also exploit low level deep features from the test frame in order to gradually upsample this and, and predict the final accurate segmentation mask. So this decoder will learn segmentation priors, what is an object boundary, and, and so on uh, to, to do this. Uh, okay, uh, what we can observe now is certainly our module here that we care about our optimization based module is now not in the output side of the network, it's in the middle of our network. So there's no real need in constraining its output to only a single channel segmentation mask. So why not uh, predict some more abstract multi-channel representation that can capture more aspects of the mask. And for this, we of course need to optimize uh, several filters to do this, or a multi-channel filter, convolution filter, depending on how you see it. So this could then in theory capture a richer representation that we can then communicate to our CNN decoder in order to do the final segmentation. Okay, the question now is what should then be our labels? What should be our target uh, when we do this uh, optimization? And so what should be, in other words, what should be the why in, in our objective here? So the core idea in, in this work was that we should uh, learn it, right? So how can we do that in practice? So basically we feed in our, uh, our uh, reference annotation into a small CNN that predicts the representation of the mask. And it learns, I mean, it learns this representation of the mask and what are the important aspects and what is a suitable representation uh, for, for our annotation mask when we want to solve this task and for our online learner. So this is denoted as the network E here. Uh, and why not also predict uh, the weights for these objectives? So if we think about it, different feature channels might have different importance. Also different spatial regions might have different importance. For instance, it might be very important to put a lot of weight on the boundaries, right? Because we want to predict very accurate boundaries, so we should have a higher loss there, maybe. Okay, so we can have another network that also uh, predict, uh, predict those weights for our residuals. Okay. Uh, so now we have formulated our objective, which have a learnable um, output, so learnable target values, and also learnable uh, weights. Now, how do we actually minimize uh, this? So let me just briefly tell you about the, the steepest descent methods that we use. Uh, so everyone knows gradient descent, of course. We have the, the step length as a hyperparameter. We take a step in the gradient direction uh, the core key difference here in steep descent is that we try to find the optimal uh, step length. Okay, so basically we're transforming a multidimensional optimization problem to a one-dimensional optimization uh, problem by constraining ourselves in the gradient direction. 
And crucially, we use a quadratic approximation of uh, the loss, unless the loss is already quadratic. And then we can find a very neat uh, and an efficient closed form solution for, uh, for this step length that basically involves just a gradient and uh, the Hessian matrix or, or the matrix in our quadratic approximation. So for instance, if we use a Gauss-Newton approximation, this would just be the Jacobian transpose Jacobian and so on. Uh, anyway, we can compute this fairly efficiently. Um, and just to show you, not so that you should memorize these equations or anything, just to show you that we can very easily implement this, or you could implement this in a few lines of PyTorch code. Let's look at how we would actually write this out. Um, so for this objective, we first compute the gradient. Turns out we can derive this formula. It's not so difficult to do that, actually. There's no fancy operations required here. We just need some convolutions, multiplications, a transpose convolution, and so on. Uh, we compute the optimal step length, uh, which is also very, very easy. We need the norm of the gradient, uh, some denominator here, which is also very simple. And then we just uh, update our, our weights uh, by taking the, the optimal step in the gradient direction. And we have also implemented, I mean, you can implement very generic algorithms using double back propagation and, and so on, where you don't even need to de uh, derive the, the analytic formulation of the gradient yourself. So PyTorch and TensorFlow and so on have double back propagation that will do everything uh, for you which makes it very easy to add non-linearities into the objective and so on. Okay, so the interesting thing here is that um, the network, uh, there are a few things that, that the network and online feature representation learns now. I mean, now we have in, integrated these learnable components into our objective. So uh, what do we actually learn? So one thing we have observed is that um, by sort of training down the line feature representations, it really learns to make the, um, make the uh, loss more well conditioned, which means that we have a faster optimization. And this is another advantage of having a differentiable solver instead, because uh, I mean, if, if we want to reach or go close to the minimum, and it's constrained to a certain number of iterations during training, it needs to do the best from these few iterations. So it is really motivated to learn a more well-conditioned objective, which is nice because then we'll also solve it more quicker in practice. Uh, so that's a very nice feature. Uh, another nice thing is that we learn a well-regularized objective because the way we train it, we force the network to generalize to a new test sample, right? So it needs to learn an objective that generalizes and regularization and so on, uh, which is also crucial for, for meta learning in general. Okay, in, uh, again, inference, we can uh, just put everything in a big uh, block diagram so we can get the overview. There's um, uh, nothing too difficult here. We just predict uh, the weights from our online learner and then uh, feed in our test frame and so on, get our prediction. And uh, what is really nice that is that we can uh, very easily uh, update our target representation during, during the video, so during segmentation. So we can add our previous prediction to our memory and then just up update our representation um, uh, with a few iterations and so on. So it might also look like this is a bit dangerous, which it could be, one could start to drift. But again, the important thing is that we can train things uh, end to end. So the network actually learns to update uh, robustly and so on. And uh, we also keep the old reference samples in memory and so on. So we're not uh, forgetting old information. Okay, so uh, we see that with this more generalized learnable formulation, we get uh, large improvements by integrating the label generator and the, the weight predictor. And yeah, at the time we had good results compared to, to state of the art. Uh, I think what is really nice here is that we observe that we can train our approach with much, much less train, <coughs> training data. So we are 
in a way we're embedding more inductive bias probably in, in our uh, network. So we need much less data to be able to achieve a state-of-the-art performance compared to our uh, competitors. So SDM was an attention-based, recent attention-based approach, for instance. Okay, and we have quite cool results. And again, I think the impressive thing is that the network can learn to segment objects that we haven't even seen during the training set. So different from instance segmentation and so on, you give it a new object, it has never seen it during training, but on the fly it learns to still, still segment it. Um, I also just want to mention that we have a very recent work where we further extend upon these formulations uh, to, to uh, predict uh, or to convert bonding box annotations to mask annotations. So uh, we can do weekly, uh, weekly supervised um, segmentation training and so on. Okay, but with the time I have left, I will go on uh, and briefly talk about this work, which we very recently submitted called Dense Caution Processes for Few Shot Segmentation. So, uh, semantic segmentation, as I told you before, we want to segment the image into a predefined set of classes. We use a lot of training data to do that. In Few Shot Semantic Segmentation, we are only given uh, we want to segment on the fly, want to le learn to segment on the fly with very little data. So we're just given a few uh, support samples that defines the objects we want to segment. And then we're given one or several core images where we, uh, where we want to do prediction. Uh, so one of the interesting challenges here that doesn't appear that much in the other tasks that I presented is uh, the following that um, for instance, in this case, we clearly want to segment humans. They are annotated in our support set. But in the query set, I mean, our support set is so limited. So our query set will inevitably encounter completely new types of objects and, con and, and context, right, that we haven't seen in our support set. So we need to be able to handle that. And I mean, in this case, where we have a big horse in the picture that we haven't seen, I mean, it's not clear what, I mean, how do we make a representation that captures that, that is ready for this? And what should our network do? That is not really clear. So our philosophy is that uh, our representation needs to be able to say that it is uncertain. I don't know what, what this is. This is a new kind of appearance uh, that I don't know. It might be target, it might be background. We need other cues to decide this. So pre-learned segmentation priors, how um, learn priors about how much intra-class variation we expect in appearance and so on. So the way uh, we do this is with uh, Gaussian processes. So similar to before, we extract the features. Of course, uh, we have the masks on our support set. And now we want to now we want this mapping between the, the features and our segmentation uh, to be a Gaussian process instead. So very briefly, Gaussian process is not actually that complicated. Basically just assume that your outputs are jointly Gaussian. Uh, the covariance is given by a kernel. So we use a, a squared exponential kernel, for instance. And then you just use Bayes rule to to factor out your query, uh, query outputs, so the, the predictions you want to do, and what you get is closed form solutions for the mean and covariance for this. So we also get uncertainty represented in this uh, covariance, uh, which we want to exploit. So our whole pipeline uh, looks something like this, and I'll just highlight the, uh, the important differences here. Now what we give to our segmentation decoder is not only uh, the mean segmentation, but also the uncertainty captured in the variance. So for instance, here we have a new context that we haven't seen before. Uh, our Gaussian process actually tells us that, okay, here I'm not really certain what the label is. And the end-to-end the -end trained uh, segmentation decoder should take this information into account when it does the final prediction. And we also see that it works even in this worst case. So here, 
more saturated regions are more um, more certain. So it's really uncertain in the case of this horse, for instance. Um, and so in this paper, we get really remarkable performance compared to state of the art. So both we show that this uncertainty is really important and also that our Gaussian process, I mean, remember that Gaussian process is very related to linear regression and so on with this addition of, of uh, being able to capture uncertainty in a very principled way. But it also scales very well to higher shot sizes or higher um, support sizes, which we think is a very important property in few shot learning, which might sound trivial, but most of the state of the art approaches are, are not able to benefit from. So if I give the system more data, it should be able to exploit that more data. Uh, okay, some more visual examples. Uh, since I'm out of time, I don't think I will talk about uh, correspondence estimation, but uh, if you're interested, we have also applied uh, these kind of uh, techniques to develop generic layers for um, for dense correspondence estimation with with uh, very good results. Uh, okay, I think I will stop there. Just briefly say, uh, briefly conclude that uh, what I talked about is how we can for a variety of tasks develop these uh, modules that do quite complex reasoning by minimizing, <laughs> minimizing an objective function. Uh, as we've seen, it's a quite general technique. You can use very explicit formulations of the loss or have very learnable, flexible component. We can see it as an inductive bias that we integrate into our neural network. And yeah, we have seen good results for several applications. Um, students that were involved in many of these uh, works as first authors and thank you very much and please if you have any questions thank you very much thank you very much martin um, we do have a bunch of questions uh, you sort of said how to uh, unroll the optimization problem, but you didn't say much about the initial conditions. How do you obtain initial conditions? Mm -hmm. Yes, you mean the initial... Um, the starting uh, point for... Yes, the initial starting point. Yeah, so we do that in a very simple way, so I didn't go into it. Uh, basically, we extract features from, uh, from the target region in this case, and uh, just feed it through a very shallow um, a shallow network, so just a few convolutions. I don't remember exactly. And this gives us the, the initial feature. So this is just a very feed forward. It does not take the background into account, just uh, the target region or just the positive samples, you could say. And uh, yeah, so it's just becomes a very coarse uh, initialization that captures some aspects of, of what we're looking for. So uh, how would you do in general then? I mean, if you have sort of a nonlinear problem there and... Uh... Uh, yeah, so in, in general, so in, in the segmentation work, uh, we actually didn't get the benefit from learning initializers, even though we were trying to use quite a lot of domain knowledge to define a good uh, initialization um, procedure. So there in the end, we just uh, used uh, zero initialization. So that also works in all the problems we have uh, seen. You can get an extra boost in, in sort of performance and so on sometimes by, by designing a dedicated initialization module. Okay, thank you. Uh... Another question here is from uh, Dev Dubashi. Uh, how much is the better generalization due to better regularis regularizing versus the implicit bias of gradient descent? Um, so the implicit bias, I don't really understand what you mean there. Just to clarify, yeah. I'm not in, uh, I mean, a lot of work, recent work is, has uh, focused on the fact that 
the better generalization properties of neural networks are due to mm. implicit bias in creating this, and it takes, mm. it takes it to a, an optimum with better mm. properties. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I think I get the point here. Yeah, so what, what is a bit different here is that we have essentially two levels of generalization because we're talking about two learning problems. So uh, we have the... So what you are talking about could be called meta-generalization um, here because uh, that relates to our outer learning uh, learning algorithm with so, so the full network that we're training with stochastic gradient descent and and so on um, what i was referring to is the generalization of our uh, inner learning mechanism so in this case here which is this quite shallow um, classifier in the end one or two convolutional layers and the generalization properties of that we can try to even learn because we can uh, simulate novel examples uh, and and so on by by drawing new test frames and so so that we can try to train for um, there is however a problem a well-known problem in meta learning that is not as severe in these applications uh, so in, in tracking or segmentation but is an important problem if you want to do these more semantic tasks like semantic, I mean, future classification or semantic, future semantic segmentation, uh, which is called meta overfitting that. So even if you simulate few shot learning episodes during training, the representations you learn are still highly tuned to the categories of objects you have in your training set, even though you simulate meta learning by drawing uh, support and query sets during training uh, and this is a very tricky thing in general for 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 meta learning uh, techniques and there are ways one can can reduce the impact uh, of of that but since in in tracking and segmentation it's a bit the, what the network learns are more more on a matching level in a way more low level uh, matching capabilities, we generalize this much more. So there we don't have so much problems with uh, generalization, uh, also on the meta level, so to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about, uh, so you, in your last work here, you talked about Gaussian processes and mm -hmm. how, how do the results depend on the choice of kernel? And what if the kernel is misspecified is a question by Mortesa. Okay, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't uh, have have the results, but we, we have an analysis of uh, different kernels and choices in the kernel uh, in the paper. Um, and uh, what we could see was that, uh, uh, so, so we tried, um, it's quite exponential and uh, Another similar one, no, I don't remember exactly which one, uh, not a nonlinear kernel at least, that was worse, both substantially better than, than uh, the linear kernel. Um, uh, so the choice of kernel matters. Um, uh, what is, oh, and okay, then what we saw is that it's quite unsensitive to the hyper parameter choice you would do in your, your kernel. Uh, the reason for that, um, is that we're learning the input feature space, right? So since we're learning it end to end, essentially we are learning also the hyperparameters of the kernel. Uh, so you need to choose it in the right magnitude so you get the good enough initialization, but after that the network learns to adapt the feature spaces and so on, such that uh, uh, the choice of, uh, of hyperparameters doesn't matter too much because the network will learn the, the correct ones anyway. And we also learn uh, learn the noise level, for instance. Okay, all right. Uh, I think we've covered most of the topics here in the question. So let me ask. Uh, I'm curious about another th thing here. I mean, mostly had quadratic objectives in your mm -hmm. 
your applications, but you, I mean, you did, did mention in the beginning sort of uh, you mm. can have other objectives and so forth. Yeah. What, what about the problem if you're in the ambiguous cases where you have multiple things? I mean, if you do tracking or you might want to follow several similar looking objects or in yeah correspondences you will you will get mm. ambiguous how, how would you handle that yeah. uh, handle that <laughs> uh, so so i don't completely get the question you mean from the optimization well, perspective or well i i i guess one po one point is from the optimizations perspective but is mm. Is it interesting from an application perspective as well? I mean, what if uh, okay. you, you might have uh, two people coming together and mm -hmm. it becomes ambiguous, so you might want to track them for a while. And after a while, you can mm -hmm. wait this ambiguate later on, for instance. OK, yes. Um, that sort of uh, application. How is that possible to do or? Uh, yeah. Uh, OK, OK, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a very good question. So uh, I should say that there are aspects of um, tracking, especially for the tracking that I really didn't go into. So uh, what uh, we're doing with these techniques is to learn uh, and as robust as possible uh, target representation. And then there are other things we need to do in the sort of full tracking pipeline. We have a separate component that is still learned jointly that does define uh, bounding box regression given the sort of robust initial location given by, uh, by this um, uh, discriminative component. Um, but then you might even have cases where you have virtually similar looking objects in a sequence uh, where just looking at the appearance is not enough because uh, objects are extremely similar or you're confused by something that looks very similar. Mm -hmm. And then you need other modules. So we have, of course, thoughts if we can also formulate that as part of the objective and so on. Uh, what we did in the work that we presented at ICCV was to have essentially a separate component that does matching between different candidates um, in two subsequent frames, uh, for instance, and let that component learn these kind of spatial priors, motion priors, and, and so on to disambiguate some of these uh, cases. Uh, so that one still relies on the input uh, from the tracker I showed here, or a sort of improved version of that tracker. Uh, but then that takes over and chooses, I mean, in these ambiguous cases where we have sort of several peaks in our confidence, which one to choose in the end. Okay. All right. So, so you have uh, thought about that too. So, all right. Uh, yeah. We have, I mean, there, there are always new challenges to, <laughs> to solve. And, and yeah, um, sometimes we need to do it in a different so, way. Right. So let's have one final question here, though, from Ortiza, so re related to that. Can your model ha models handle the non-stationary cases, uh, for example, where the data or task might change? Uh, non. Where the data per task might change. So, so at which level are we talking now? Can, can you give an example? Of. Hi, maybe I can just give the example. For example, when yes. you use this Gaussian uh, process, mm -hmm. then you might be in the setting where the data changes uh, or the model changes. For example, you, mm -hmm. you have already fixed the hyperparameters for this kernel function and just yes. the data or the task changes. And I would like to just see how the adaptation, how fast adaptation can happen here. Uh, yeah, okay, that, that, that's a good question. So just to clarify that, that what we do right now is to, of course, train everything around the Gaussian process, including type of parameters of the kernel, the input representation, the output representation, and these neural networks and modules that sits uh, both before and after. We train in general for the few shot segmentation tasks, so not for specific uh, classes, but so then during test time, you can give it any, any kind of support set and any kind of core set, and it should be able uh, to work. Um, and 
And okay, so, so, so then one could think about extending that to more general settings in a bit different way. One thing that we did uh, analyze uh, or, or do analyze in the paper is uh, if you have a change in distribution. So we do, we do cross data set uh, validation. So uh, one different data sets capture different types of objects or different kinds of scenes and different priors and so on. So we can uh, see how well we generalize to a different distribution of, of data in that sense. Uh, the next level, uh, which is interesting, as you said, how can we move to more general task? I don't know if that would mean that we not necessarily do segmentation, but but something else or predict more things about the the, the objects. Um, uh, that is surely interesting, something that I haven't thought about much, but something we want to do if we want to go towards more uh, more general or develop more general capabilities that, that our networks can do, uh, of course. Uh, so for that, I don't really have a clear answer, but yeah, that, that's for certainly an interesting thing for future future directions. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Uh, I think in the, yeah, in the interest of time, we, we should uh, stop now and uh, so, Thank you everyone for listening and this, this talk will be available on uh, YouTube later on in our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for all the questions.